Yeah, so this is basically how kind of I use Cinemetrics uh, over the years, and usually I receive strong criticism and reactions about what, what we're doing uh, with Cinemetrics and limitations that, uh, of course, uh, are there. So I start with those limitations that usually um, um, I receive uh, kind of severe criticism of Cinemetrics. So the first one is that editing is um, not the only factor uh, that determines the speed of the movie. And uh, I think the, uh, sorry, um, the presentation on Kars Maki was, was a good example. So the, the impression is that the, his films are slow and it's not the same thing with like Tree of Life. Um, or I had like example of a Japanese cult movie um, auditioned by Takashi Miku. <laughs> And it's very interesting that it's, it's a, if you've seen the film, it's a very slow film, like for the first maybe um, hour of the film. It's like art films. And at the end, it becomes like very creepy and intense and horrific. So you people usually, because of the intensity of the content at the end, people think that it's becoming uh, somehow faster and more dynamic. Actually, the graph shows the opposite way. Um, other examples I had, like Bride of Frankenstein. Um, it's faster than Battleship Potemkin. It's something that I wouldn't expect. Uh, a, a horror movie is in the 30 to be at, like, uh, um, like as dynamic as, as a film made by the Soviets. Um, so one thing is that, yes, what, what, what determines the speed of the film? Because it's, we, it seems that we cannot always predict. Um, the second... Uh, um, problem or limitation is that cinematic software is incapable of measuring the, the missing time. The good example is Jean Le Godard's Breathless, because it's um, in terms of re perceiving uh, or the, the, the perceived time of the, the, the image, in, in, it's important to notice how much time is missing. Like sometimes there are like three frames, um, like the jump, like are taken out, and sometimes like twenty seconds, and def definitely that changes the way we experience time in a movie like that. Uh, the, the confusion that that is created. Um, the third one is that the statistical me method is limited to measure time and is uh, insensible to the time within the image. And what I say is perceived time. If we have a movie that has ten shots, all ten seconds. But the last two shots are in a slow motion. There would be a flat uh, trend line, definitely. Well, we kind of we experience the last two shots in, in a different way, is slower. Um, and the last one, um, similar, is that statistical analysis is at odds with our emotional involvement with the f film word. Uh, actually, Yuri, in the um, kind of the introduction of the movie measure measurement method, uh, kind of explains that that. Yes, uh, the, the kind of uh, it's important to acknowledge that problem, but it's the uh, the cinematics kind of or a statistical method doesn't binds us to to kind of statistical analysis. It's just it's just a tool to kind of to uh, helps us uh, learn certain things about editing. Uh, what I'm interesting is interested in uh, is uh, uh, bringing uh, kind of uh, human perception into the studies see how uh, kind of human perception can be involved uh, in uh, measurement analysis. Uh, so kind of re reconciling this kind of perception of the machine and the perception of the human. Um, so it's, um, I can see kind of um, my bridge's photo, uh, the, the horse galloping. If uh, there's something that we cannot see with the naked eyes, and again, there's a criticism, what, what, then it doesn't matter if we do not perceive something in film. And a machine does, why does it matter? Because it was not meant to be perceived. But the whole idea is that because if it challenges the way you perceive, because the next time, at knowing this fact, perceiving uh, the, the horse galloping or uh, in a different way, and we may recognize those elements. Um, so, um, I'm going to, uh, one um, important thing is labeling, I kind of used that uh, quote from Warren Buckland in terms of mise-en-shot criticism. 
uh, is the importance of labeling uh, because that brings humans uh, perception cannot always define we had like kind of discussions about defining close-ups or um, uh, point of view shots and so that's definitely is um, it's a, re a relation between graph and perception of the film and uh, so different elements of mise-en-scene can be used but also like the last presentation it's like I have something like uh, something like character shots how kind of um, one character is represented through through the whole movie uh, like with how many people in the frame or like in terms of uh, close-ups and so on um, there's also the reliability of ASL uh, because they, they sometimes lie uh, in terms of the films of Ernest Lubitsch that I, I'm going to give some examples from that um, there might be a lengthy time in in a film like One Hour with You, in the beginning and end, uh, when <coughs> Maurice Chevalier is talking to the camera for a long period of time, and that's not really <coughs> part of uh, like the, the real pace of the film. So, um, if we take that part out, you see you might see that actually Jeanette MacDonald is getting more screen time, uh, and it's actually it's more dominant uh, in, in that film. Um, so I'm going to actually go through some of my examples uh, that I chose. Um, sorry, it was hard to, to uh, kind of copy paste them in, in PowerPoint site or the website. Um, one uh, example is this is from Twelve Angry Men. I made it uh, with the lowest rate and high angles. Uh, what you see, uh, it's. The movie is very uh, kind of uh, slow in the end. The first shot is 12 minutes. So that little part is like basically maybe 20 minutes of the film and it's become faster and faster and faster. And this is uh, at the same time we're changing the angle um, uh, of, the, of the camera. Uh, so we have um, kind of slight um, uh, high angle in the maybe first part of the film. That is as the camera is judging this character and then you have red that more red that is supposed to be a kind of eye level camera and and yellow when you start seeing the ceiling uh, in that film. So one might say that this is some sort of observation. You can you can see that with uh, naked eye it's just you don't really need cinematrics. Uh, it just gives a good kind of um, um, maybe a good uh, overall image and it's actually good for, for teaching uh, to show this kind of consistency of style. Um, if I go with, uh, in terms of um, more kind of uh, interesting results that I got, uh, this is from a film by Ernest Lubitsch, um, a Schmuck the Kindman's Line, uh, 1918. It's uh, I Wouldn't Want to Be a Man. Uh, actually, I had the honor of working with Charles O'Brien, uh, wrote my th uh, master thesis on Lubitsch. Uh, so this is in terms of Ozzy's all those close-ups, and the movie has three acts. Um, her close-ups are more evenly distributed in act two, which she's in a cross-gendered performance, or cross-dressing performance. Uh, it, like, the last act is just in the very end, you see many close-ups of her, and you don't see as many close-ups of her in the first act. So it's camera is paying more attention to her. Uh, kind of there is a kind of even distribution in the middle, and uh, when she's in the kind of um, androgynous performance. Um, more in Lubitsch, uh, kind of uh, this I use um, kind of again I use different actors and number of people in the frame. Uh, kind of to see the density of the shot and how often they appear. Uh, it's just something that I uh, um, constantly do. But this is Trouble, Trouble in Paradise by Ernest Lubitsch. So I'm usually it's eight categories. Uh, characters alone, in two shots, in three shots, four shots, and on some compositions. Uh, I was not expecting that to have only uh, this three, um, uh, basically, parameters being used, like I was expecting to kind of uh, have shots of all the eight characters. So I realized that um, that Marion Hopkins in that film is never shown 
in in ensemble compositions. Um, so it's just there are two, three shots, like with two other characters in the film, and the rest of it is just 29 and 30. So the wife is scenes that she's not in, uh, she's not the main characters actually. Um, this is interesting because it's something that I wouldn't uh, expect. You cannot pay attention um, like right away. I mean, still, uh, this is like when I it's reminded the way I showed you that that my bridge is um, uh, the, the horse galloping fit because um, for some reason sometimes certain movies you have a better prediction if um, for instance it's, uh, more like art movies like coffee and cigarettes so you know that they're drawing scenes with. Uh, many characters in a, sh in a frame. But because in this film there are scenes in parties, there's crowd crowded scenes, but never with that actors. Never with Mariam Hopkins. So it seems that Lubitsch has this tendency to isolate that character even in scenes that uh, are taking place in parties and crowd crowded situations. Um, and this is like kind of when I say that they're kind of reconciling this kind of um, uh, human perceptions and machine perceptions, like a scientist that accidentally uh, discovers something, and can I s now look at things from now, now that I kind of accidentally uh, um, figured it out, can, is that true for all Miriam Hopkins films, or all Lubitsch's films that feature Miriam Hopkins? It's just, you start to pay attention to the films and see that, uh, kind of, does Lubitsch always isolate that specific actress? Um, uh, so it's just the kind of how a specific filmmaker um, sees a, a specific uh, star or features it. So I started the second one, uh, The Smiling Lieutenant, uh, a, a film by Ernest Lubitsch that has Miriam Hopkins in it. Actually, I, it, I didn't find the same results so because there are actually um, so it's, you, you do not always find the same result, but you start to pay attention to such factors. So actually, um, as the result uh, with Smiling Lieutenants, we have scenes uh, with more than five characters in the film, uh, in the frame, like uh, six shots at least, and uh, with three shots, we have 10 shots like that. So you have all kinds of shots. But one thing is important still, um, in terms of content of the film, there's a turning point. Um, she, it, it's uh, like the, 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 the moral perspective of the character is changes. And maybe, uh, so uh, the, for instance, the white thing that is a uh, character in, in crowded scene, uh, or a green uh, that is with like, four characters uh, in the scene. So we see more of those shots, like white in the middle, and in the beginning, so at some point when there is a turning point of the character, it seems that actually the, the thing works. So uh, after um, the, that uh, the kind of basically climactic moment that she's a different person, it seems that actually she's isolated and you only get two shots or single shots of her. Um, so that was a kind of um, interesting uh, result in terms of uh, Ernest Lubitsch. Um, I picked up other um, uh, films, uh, other interesting results I had. This is from Hiroshima Monomo. One thing is that actually the, the filmmaker says that uh, he was inspired by Stravinsky in making that, that film. And you see some sort of compositions in terms of the speed, like there are like four movements, slow, like the, the <laughs> Largo, and you know, <laughs> like uh, the, the second movement, the third movement, it's, just, it's, uh, it's nicely composed. And you can see the interesting flashbacks kind of inserted at certain points, that the blue ones are the flashbacks. Um, kind of, they are like actually counterpoints. And, uh, in their compositions. Um, uh, this is from um, kind of a movie made in uh, Germany in the year 2000, uh, Amy and Jaguar. Uh, actually, I made different, like four or five uh, kind of uh, uh, different graphs of it, and it's interesting when you put all, all the elements together. Uh, this one shows that in terms of lighting, there is a kind of uh, some sort of interesting change. Um, so the 
sorry, high key light, high key, it's with the char two characters in the film, two main characters, and lighting. So, for instance, the character uh, Lily and high key, uh, that one, the, the light blue. Um, this is, it seems that, again, with the turning point of the film, there is more kind of high key lighting when she's in the frame, in the maybe first 50 minutes of the film. And then you can see more low key lighting. It's just some, uh, and it's the opposite for the other character in this one drama. So it's just it's a shift in lighting uh, <coughs> when each character uh, is in the frame. Frame uh, that kind of it's become it's becomes dominant. Uh, actually, it's better to see this one is better uh, to maybe actually uh, uh, remove uh, some of the uh, categories. You can see the consistency better. Um, uh, another example is with, uh, in terms of remake. This is um, Psycho, showers in comparison between Alfred Hitchcock and um, Gossman Sam. The, the two shower sequences uh, similar. Um, in terms of ASL, it's um, uh, Hitchcock's is a little longer. Uh, but. I have a better uh, or, or maybe more interesting uh, result in terms of the comparison between uh, the remake of Night of the Living Dead in the 1960s and um, um, Night of the Living Dead, the, the remake by Tom Savini in the 1990s. It's very interesting that, um, okay, so one thing is that I did the 1968 version twice. And the ASL is 5.4, so it's kind of accurate. Um, kind of, uh, and what was interesting, I did Night of the Living Dead remake, and it's still 5.4 the ASL. It's kind of um, I found it interesting, but uh, also the graphs are very similar. Um, the the kind of trend line, it's it's very similar, and the categories that little green. Um, uh, yellow is the scenes inside, blue is the outside, green is in the car, like that kind of thing. And even the categories are distributed in a very similar ways. So it's 5.4 average shot length exactly <coughs> for both films. And a very similar kind of pattern. And it's still I see that criticism, criticism some people make. So what? It doesn't prove anything. Uh, well, what, again, it's you can say yes, but it can be used as still as extra like testimony if you study the kind of um, studios approach to remake. If there's any studies of just how, how kind of um, uh, kind of uh, remakes or theories of remakes or what sort of approaches uh, directors take uh, with regards to remake, definitely a, a kind of um, a comparison like like that it is useful and it can be used as um, kind of um, as I said a, a kind of testimony uh, or support. Um, um, so yeah, that's uh, with my example. So I, um, I tried to kind of find um, kind of um, uh, just pick some of the the images that I usually use. Um, so. Yeah, basically that's that's my kind of it's uh, just bringing the the whole idea of attention uh, with cinematics is the fact that you can process different ideas at the same time. So it's not just a shot length. It's just um, in a way you kind of I think over the years, I, even when it's just I watch, watch movies without cinematics, it's kind of now I'm becoming like more uh, able. I, I'm able. Of, kind of capable of processing different information all the time, like thinking about all these things and shot transitions. And it's just uh, kind of, it's also, it's interesting that the kind of education that, that such tools bring, it's just uh, in terms of tension, it just changes the way we pay attention to movies. It's just not the kind of only passive observations.